Welcome to this week's weekly webinar series. My name is Molly Keck and I am an entomologist with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service in Bear County. And this is a paired presentation. Make sure if you didn't already, check out David Rodriguez, our horticulturist with the AgriLife Extension Service in Bear County's presentation on the best Mother's Day plants. This presentation is on what could possibly be eating those Mother's Day plants. So hopefully you're watching this maybe a month after you purchased your mother, some great uh, plants that don't die quickly, and maybe you're noticing that you've got some insect issues on them. Um, and so we'll go over what those could possibly be and how you can um, allow those, those plants to survive long past just Mother's Day. Orchids was one of the plants that David mentioned and was a favorite of many people um, for Mother's Day plants. And orchids can get a number of, of insect issues with them. One of the main insect issues that they get is mealybugs and scales. And in these pictures, what you're looking at are cottony cushion mealybugs um, and or actually long tailed mealybugs that make a cotton cushion type um, image on the plant where it looks like you've got little cotton pieces. These guys will mealybugs and scales will will both lose vigor of the plant. The plant will start to lose leaves and it starts to lose buds. And then, of course, it's not going to flower if there are no buds. And the thing about these things, especially mealybugs, is that they can hide anywhere. This is a floral clip that looks like a hair clip at the bottom. Um, and they can hide under the ledges of potted plants or anything like that. So if you've got an issue with mealybugs and scales, you don't want to just treat the plant. You want to check everything that that plant is around. The bio, um, bios duval scale. Um, is a really common one on our orchids. And you can see that they get pretty much all over the orchid and you can see the buildup that's happening right here in this picture. So that's another one to look out for. Initially, it kind of looks like um, little warts on the plant and it goes up the leaves and they, with all scales, they tend to congregate in one spot. And it's almost like it starts at the base of the plant and then spreads up. So. Um, check for the spots where it seems like the majority of the scales are, but you also want to treat the entire plant because there are crawlers that have moved past that heavy population where they just don't fit anymore. This is a brown scale. It's also common on your orchids and it's just a, a brown color. What's amazing to me about scales is that this is an actual insect. Um, if you were to flip it underneath, you could see the body parts, you could see the six legs, but from above it has this scale or this uh, waxy layer that is covering it that protects it. So many times if you've treated with scales, they're still going to remain stuck to the plant. So you always want to make sure that you come back, you know, a week later or so between treatments and um, spray it really good or clean it off really well, some sort of, you know, with your fingernail or some way physically remove those. And that gives you an idea if you're actually reducing the population or if you're just spraying and spraying and spraying more and more dead ones. It also allows you to penetrate um, through, that pesticide can get through and get to any eggs or little tiny crawlers that are maybe being protected by the waxy layer of all the adults that are accumulating on top of it. So for mealybug and scale management, if your plants are planted outdoors, by and large predators and good rainstorms will help keep the populations relatively low. But you do want to monitor pretty regularly to make sure that populations don't get out of control. That's usually what happens is we um, don't notice that there's an issue until the issue becomes very bad. Indoors, the populations are allowed to grow extremely large. And this is because um, there just aren't natural enemies that make their way inside. One thing that's imperative to know about mealybugs and scales is that the life cycle is very short. So you want a 10 to 14 day treatment interval it is imperative to reducing the population. So whatever product you are using, read the label and determine when you can come back and retreat. Um, within 10 to 14 days is when eggs have hatched and they're crawling to new spots. So you wanna actually treat the entire plant every 10 to 14 days. Alcohol rubs can be effective, especially for indoor plants. Um, just be very careful to keep it away from, you know, sunlight It's probably not something you wanna to try to do outside. If the infestations are relatively low, oils and insecticidal soaps are a great option. Um, but if the infestations are very persistent, you want to use something that is a little more harsh on these guys that can control more of the life cycle, the life stages, the eggs and the crawlers, um, and that can penetrate through that waxy layer that they may have formed on top of themselves. 
So products that have acephate, malathion, or carbaryl are good options for you. Um, if plants are in serious decline, you should consider destroying them. It's very hard to know um, when to pull that plant up, but if it looks really, really bad, consider culling it and getting rid of it. Otherwise, your other plants will, will start to get pretty bad. And three applications um, are very important, at least 10 to 14 days apart. Make sure that you don't do it less than 10 days if you can do that at all possible and never go more than 14 days. I like to stick within the 10 to 14 day interval. Roses are a very favorite plant that we love to put in our garden and in our landscape. They're a very hardy plant and they produce, of course, beautiful flowers that are usually pretty fragrant. But roses have a lot of insects that will damage them. The big ones are thrips, beetles, leafcutter bees, and then also mites sometimes. In the springtime, thrips are a major, major problem. And what you will notice on your buds is browning as the bud um, even hasn't even opened. It almost looks like something came and chewed on it. That's probably thrips damage. And it's worse in the spring because thrips tend to prefer to feed on pollen. And when there's an abundance of pollen just in our landscape, these populations will rise and they will be attracted to roses and they'll start to chew on the edges of roses. And the cuttings that you take from your roses just aren't pretty enough to really put in a vase. So they are something that you wanna to try to control because the point of having roses for most of us is to have these beautiful flowers. So if you notice that you have an issue with thrips, try to remove the infested buds and destroy them far away from the plant. Don't clip them and throw them down onto the ground. Take them far away to a trash can or put them inside. Uh, because the thrips will just move off of those that you've destroyed. Um, treat the thrips before they enter the rosebud. So as the bud is still teeny, teeny, tiny, that's the time to, to apply a pesticide to and around those buds. There's a number of products that you can purchase that will be effective against thrips. Um, you just need to read the label and you will have to do multiple treatments as long as the thrip populations are high. And there's nothing that you can do to control the thrip populations around your roses. All you can do is just try to salvage the roses that you have. So horticultural oils are great. Neem oil is good and has a little bit longer residual. Pyrethrins, insecticidal soaps, spinosad. If you're not sure that you can find rose, the thrips, if you're tapping your roses and you're not seeing them crawling around on your hands, spinosad, neem, and pyrethrin, um, and dinotefuran are probably your three better options. But if you know that it's heavily infested with thrips and you can see them on the plant, in that case, the horticultural oils and the soaps will be effective against the thrips. There are also a number of beetles that will damage roses. Depending on where you are in Texas, you might have the Japanese beetle, kind of a bronze looking scarab, looks like a May beetle. Um, but in the San Antonio area, we don't have this species. They have those little tufts of white hair along the margins. Their wings are bronze in color and the rest of the body is kind of a green metallic. So they're actually a really pretty beetle, smaller than our typical May beetle, June beetles. Um, but again, in the San Antonio area and south of here, we do not, we do not have these species or we do not believe to have these species. Um, there's also a number of other beetles that can harm and, and chew on your roses. And what they're really doing is they're damaging the leaf and if the plant is not putting out new leaves, then it's not going to make new sprouts for roses. So it is something that you want to try to control if your goal is to have a full bush of roses. The best management for beetles on roses is going to be a midacloprid type products that you'll spray onto the plant. But you do need to be careful because those will affect your pollinators. Horticultural oils um, can work if they're present on the plant. If they're not present, don't waste your time with it. Same thing with insecticidal soaps. Don't waste your time unless you physically see the beetle and can spray it. Spinosad will give you a little bit longer residual. That's a good option for you. Neem could potentially give you a little longer residual and also pyrethrin. Uh, one insect that's kind of funny that will um, seemingly cause damage to your plants are leafcutter bees. Leafcutter bees are a pollinating bee. Most of them do pollinate. Not every species of these leafcutter bees um, will cut the flowers, but they love to do this to rose plants for some reason. So if you go outside and you see near perfect circles that have been cut, like a three quarter circle from your leaves, don't necessarily be alarmed. There's a little bee that's coming and chewing and cutting that little cutting um, and taking it back to some sort of a cylinder. It could be an empty shaft of a, a hollow shaft of a plant that's died. It could be bamboo. It could be 
the bee houses that you put out in your yard. But what they're doing is they're going to line it with those cuttings. It's kind of like an insulation. And then they lay their eggs inside those tubings, provision it with some food. Um, and when the babies hatch, they have food that was left by the mother behind. So if you're seeing these on your rose plants, I wouldn't be overly concerned and I wouldn't do anything about it because you you will essentially be harming a pollinator if you're trying to prevent from happening. It's really an environmental indicator that you have some great pollinators in your landscape um, and it's really a good thing to have. You might also be dealing with mites on your roses. Mites tend to thrive when it gets very, very hot. So in the early spring, you may not see this issue. But as the, the summer wears on and our temperatures start to rise, this is when the populations of these mites will rise. Mites are pretty stuck on the plant, so they're not traveling very far, which means that oils and insecticidal soaps can be effective against them. But you have to be very careful and do a little bit of research to determine what type of products to use for mites. Sometimes, even if mites are on the label, it will actually cause a flare-up because the product isn't a true miticide. You want something that truly controls mites and is not just an insecticide. Mites are very funny and some products actually make them grow better or make the, the situation worse than reduce the situation at all. Because mites um, love and thrive when temperatures are very hot, things like putting an artificial shade over the plant or watering more so that you reduce the soil temperature and it, that soil temperature radiates coolness back up onto the plant. Those types of things will reduce the mite populations because it, they're just not thriving. The temperatures are not what they're happiest um, around. And really typical mite damage you can see in that right hand picture is a stippling effect, kind of a bleached or a blanched look to the leaves that just don't quite look right. Loss of vigor, overall vigor in the plant. Of course, you're not gonna get roses that are gonna shoot off from these types of um, leaves or these stems that are producing leaves with this type of damage. So if you do want flowers, you do wanna control the mites. Remember that roses are attracted, attractive to pollinators. So um, although we usually think of roses as being self-pollinated or wind pollinated, there are many pollinators that are attracted to it and will come to those plants. So be really careful about what pesticides you apply so that you are not killing off your beneficial insects. Apply during the time of day, such as evening when these guys are asleep or in their hives, um, and avoid applying pesticides when the pollinators are present. University of California um, has a great IPM program, Integrated Pest Management Program, and they have a good resource for um, what rose pests are out there and then what you can do about these rose pests. So if you're having an issue with rose pests, um, you love to have roses in your landscape, but you really want to try to manage what's doing damage to it, be sure and check out this website because it will provide you a lot of great information um, for the future and for now. Hibiscus was another Mother's Day um, option that David provided. Hibiscus, of course, is a beautiful, tropical, brightly colored, very large flowering plant. Um, and there's a number of insects that can get on them. One of those would be white flies. And you can see from this picture right here, a number of adult white flies that are on this hibiscus. In this picture, what you see is a number of the white fly nymphs. So the nymphs aren't cannot move and you want to definitely control these because it will mean you have less of an adult population. Um, soil applied imidacloprid so that it goes up into the roots of the plant and as these guys are feeding they're affected by it can provide very valuable control for white fly management but pollinators may be affected. Um, we know that some of that imidacloprid can get into uh, the pollen um, and we can we do sometimes find it negatively affecting our pollinators so that's something to be considerate of you need to determine, are, is your white fly issue really a bad problem or can I tolerate it, use something else um, so that my pollinators are okay? If your plant's really, really negatively affected, it's probably not blooming anyway. And so in that case, this might be a good option for you. If the white flies populations are something that you think that you can manage with continual treatments, then neem and soaps and oils can, can be effective. You must apply it directly to the white flies. And since the babies are on the underside of the leaves, make sure that you get a good application under there. Begonias often are a plant that we plant, um, either leave in a pot or that we put um, in the ground. And begonias have a way of um, kind of making a big giant canopy over the soil. 
And this allows for humidity and excessive moisture to build up, which is what these little sow bugs or pill bugs thrive in. And so what they might do is start feeding on the edges of the flowers and, and especially of the um, leaves and causing some aesthetic damage that, that you just don't wanna see on your begonias. To control these guys, try to reduce moisture. Allow that mulch to dry out. Um, move the begonias above ground if they're potted so that you allow some airflow to happen. There are also some baits that you can try to use. Bug and slug baits generally will be attractive to um, pill bugs, but they you have to reapply. As soon as it's gone, you have to put it out. It's not like a bait, as in fire ant bait, where it kills an entire colony and they share it with each other. It only kills who you get. A lot of people try to use beer baits. So just take some sort of a cup, burrow it into the ground so that it's uh, flush and put beer in there. Um, some people put a little bit of brown sugar to make it sweet as well. And so as it kind of ferments, there are the ground dwelling things are attracted to that fermentation and they fall in. And then you can reduce the population a little bit that way also. Water lilies generally don't have pest issues, but because you put water lilies in places where water is stagnant, you often have mosquito issues. Mosquitoes love to kind of hide underneath the water lilies. Um, the, the adults have a spot to land on to lay their eggs. Generally, the water lilies allow for less um, water flow to be happening, so it becomes stagnant. Um, there's a lot of organic food material that you now have because you have roots in there. Um, it's producing, you know, you might fertilize. There, it's producing a lot of organic matter. So if you uh, deal with mosquitoes, what you're trying to control are the eggs that they lay in the water, the larvae are in the water, and so are the pupa. If we can kill the larvae, then we don't have adults. We don't have larvae making pupa, and then we don't have adults coming out. So um, try to control them within the water because that's an easy target as opposed to the whole entire world trying to shoot at, you know, the little flying ones that are very mobile. You can use BTI dunks or granules. This is a kind of an organic option. It is specific to only flies. So it will not hurt koi if you have koi in the pond. It will not hurt wildlife that you think might be feeding on it. It will not hurt birds. It will not hurt uh, dragonflies that might lay their eggs in the water or be in your water. Dragonflies are not true flies. So what this controls are mosquitoes, biting flies, midges, anything that's in the fly family diptera. If you don't like, if you're still opposed um, to using products such as this, which can last you up to about 30 days of control, um, make sure that you have a fountain that that uh, allows the water to be continually flowing. Also, make sure that you don't have an excess of foliage around the edges of your pond. Those are two things that you can try to do. But by and large, what you'll usually find is that you'll need to use um, some sort of BTI mosquito dunk which is safe for the water lilies and safe for anything else unless you're a fly. Anthuriums um, might end up getting an issue called fungus gnats or a fly called fungus gnats, especially if they're um, potted plants and indoor plants because we don't have the same airflow that you have outside. You don't have the same evaporation rates that you have outside. Fungus gnats usually just feed in the soil where fungus is allowed to grow because there's excessive moisture. The larvae are feeding on it. The adults are just a major nuisance. Um, but some species of fungus gnats are known to feed on roots. So in some cases, they can be an actual harmful pest to the plant. But in by and large, in most cases, they're just a nuisance because you don't like these gnats flying around your house. The best way to try to control fungus gnats is to reduce moisture, which will reduce the fungus that's growing in the soil. That's what they're attracted to. That's why they lay their eggs there, because that's what they know that their babies can feed on. You can also try to repot the plant in fresh soil. Um, also, cut back on your fertilizing. Cut back on the application of blood meal um, or manure or other fertilizers that have an excessive amount of organic material. Um, you can also use BTI, these are flies, so BTI will be effective against them. Most of the time though, what you're using instead of the granules or the dunks for um, mosquitoes is you're using a product that's much more fine. So as you water it in, it gets down into the soil and they are exposed to those spores and they feed on those spores. It doesn't dissolve as well in those really thick granules that you might apply. Nematodes can also control the fungus gnats. My issue with nematodes, though, are that nematodes love really moist soil, and that's where they thrive, and that's also where fungus gnats thrive. So 
you, unless this is soil that you know you can never keep dried out, first dry the soil out and that will help with the name, with the uh, fungus gnat issue. Otherwise, you're kind of continuing, continuing to have a fungus gnat issue by harboring the nematodes there. You can try to use some drenches of pyrethrin and permethrin and bifenthrin. All those products could be labeled for fungus gnats. But by and large, just repotting if you can, um, cutting back on the moisture levels, those will control the fungus gnats without you having to really use any pesticides. Aphids are a pest of many, 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 many plants. Um, we could talk about them for pretty much all of the plants that we talked about today. So just giving a blanket information about how to control aphids. Seldom does it kill a mature plant. So um, if your plant is nice and mature and very healthy, it's not really something that um, you probably have to be highly concerned about. There are a lot of natural enemies, including ladybugs, that can control these guys. You can kill them with pretty much anything, but because they are very much like Scales and mealybugs, you need to get on a regimen of about 10 to 14 days treating to help cut down on the population. One of the ways that you know that aphids are affecting your plants is because it is not producing flowers very well for you. So look under the leaves, take a look, see if you have a lot of aphids. Um, insecticidal soaps will cut them down. So will oils, neem, pyrethrins, acephate, permethrin, even soil drenches of imidacloprid if it's a really, really heavy population or maybe a plant that you cannot get under the leaves very well or treat very often. David talked about citrus as being a great option for Mother's Day. And I, all I'll do is just revert you back and tell you to go back and watch our citrus pests webinar um, on the same YouTube channel that you're at right now. So thank you for joining us for this week's weekly webinar series. Um, I hope that you bought mother some, your mom, some great Mother's Day plants, and hopefully you never have an issue with any of these insects. But if you do, this will always be housed here on our YouTube channel, My Extension 210. And be sure to check out all of the other webinars that we have posted to that YouTube channel as well. Again, my name is Molly Peck, and I'm an entomologist with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service.